Yo, yo, yo. Welcome to another episode of Crate 808. And today we've got a very special guest on board, a man who's been spitting flows since wearing shoes with Velcros, the UK rhyme spitter with a Midas touch and a severe case of Mary Jane-itis, founder of High Focus Records, a one quarter of the four owls. We got the mic cut, cut, killer flip tricks in the house. How are you doing, bro? Jeez, jeez. I made that intro, man. Yeah, I'm doing Doing very well, man. All good, thanks. I man. appreciate uh, if, if people don't know Flip Tricks, you, you have a heavy output of stuff, not only with the label, but your own stuff. So I appreciate you making the time, man, and, and you know, just stepping on board for us and chat some 90s hip hop, man. Yeah, for real, now, man. It's a pleasure. Oh, wicked. First thing, though, first thing we ask every guest that yeah. comes on what's the least hip hop thing you've done in the last 24 hours? Oh, <laughs> probably uh, cleaning, cleaning clothes for. Uh, for my new baby that's coming in a few weeks man. oh so. mate that is the cutest answer I've had so far that's amazing <laughs> oh, that's mate, a congrats. big release isn't it that's, that's the next big drop yeah man. congrats man congrats mate I feel you it's all that I never yeah. knew that when we had our kid it was like well I've got to clean everything yeah yeah every Everything has to be clean. So yeah, not, not the most rap thing, but I like it. I like it. it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so mate, first of all, we've got a lot of listeners out here, US, obviously UK mm. as well. Tell us a little bit though, like about what you're doing right now, uh, where you're at. Basically, you've got high focus records that we know all about. Mm. What is it, 2010, right? You've been around since 2010? Yeah, so um, yeah, I founded the label in 2010. Like first made my name sort of on the scene in 2007. That's mm. when I put out my first album, Force Fit Imagery. That was actually before High Focus. And then uh, a few years passed and I got my second album, Theory of Ryan, together. So I've shopped it about um, a bit. And then, um, yeah, just on why I was like, you know, I'd recommend you start your own label. I was looking to put it out on there, but mm. it would have taken a while um, to get it out. So I thought, yeah, I'll make my own thing. And that was initially just to release my own projects. But after I did that, it, it did a good job on that. And then I had, you know, mates like Jan Baxter and Dirty Dyke around and they had albums and it all just sort of fell sort of like naturally uh, and organically and sort of built from there. And then just been working real hard on that. And um, at the moment, been working on a new solo album, um, which hopefully I'm going to get out, hopefully get out in uh, 2020 as well, like a little bit later on in the year. And um been spending a lot of time uh, finishing up the new Four Hours album. Oh, um, mate. Right. We, we're going we're gonna to talk about the Four Hours album. Uh, there's yeah. been a lot of hype. You dropped a few posts beforehand. But before we get into that, right, because it's, 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 it's an inspiring story. Just tell, you know, just that, like, you know, I had an album. I wanted to bring it out. You talked about yeah. Jest, who's like a UK hip hop legend. And, you know, he is <clears> advising you. But before any of that, like when you were growing up then, like what was your childhood like when you were growing up? Like in your house, was there a lot of music or what did you kind of s- slip into it another way? How, how did it how did it all come about, man? Yeah, I mean, I've always been, uh, my dad was always really into music and um, he he had a vinyl collection. You know, he used to play in a band and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so the musical vibe uh, was always there, you know, when we were young. When when I did get into hip hop, you know, we terrorized his record collection, <laughs> scratching it on on the decks that weren't meant for weren't meant for scratching. And I was about twelve or thirteen, I think, when I first heard hip hop. And one of my earliest memories uh, was going into Brixton R Price, R Price, which oh. is actually shut down now. And yeah. I remember walking in and hearing. Uh, Eminem, hi, my name is. And I was just like, hi, my name is what? And then, yeah, yeah, when I heard that, I was like, shit, who is this guy? Like, they had the single there and it was 99p to buy it. And it had, I think it was Guilty Conscience on uh, yeah, yeah, as the yeah. second track. Or, and yeah, mate, that for me inspired me a lot. Was that, so that's the first time, was that the first time you really listened to rap then? I don't know if that, I need to sort of check the dates because obviously we're, we're going back a long time. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the, uh, the Fuji's, the score mm. as well that album was one of the main sort of hip-hop albums that I listened to a lot. Um, you know, it started from the Fugees, then it went mm. to, you know, Biggie. Like, I always mention the three bigs, like Biggie, Big Pun and Big L. For me, were like three massive uh, inspirations. So, yeah, I did get really heavily into US rap. Then, you know, even people like Jedi Mind Tricks, you know, Cypress Hill, a lot, a lot of groups like that. Yeah, for a few years, just heavy on the US stuff, you know, not mm. even contemplating that it was something that I was going to be involved in at all not even pretending to rap or like practicing it or or anything I didn't even you know I was so far detached from America never been to America Mm. they're all talking about you know shooting guns selling drugs and stuff it's you know like a fantasy (laughs) land or whatever you know when 
when you're that age. So it wasn't until I was 16 and I heard, you know, just Skinny Man Task Force, mm -hmm. I realized, oh, wow, people are doing this here. Yeah. And that's when it inspired me in the creative sense, you know, to actually jump in. So before yeah. before we jump into that, then I need to know, man. Like you grew up like me, then basically like lot of lot of US influence. Have you got any favorite Biggie or Pun or Big L bars that you always think like shit, man? You're not going to top that. Is there anything that you can think of? Oh, mate, oh yeah, I was thinking it um, about it earlier, but um, you know, Big Pun, you ain't a killer. That track for me is. Oh. Uh, mate you know people might even hear it still to this day but like he his flow influenced my flow quite mm. a lot I'm, I'm really into flow patterns and the the intricacy mm. you know intricism and and content and he really impressed me and um yeah i think that in influenced me a fair amount do you remember like there being a shift then like when did you change from being like someone on the sidelines checking the like, culture until actually you know taking part in it Mate, yeah the, to be honest the shift was actually like really fast because i had a few mates around me who were we were all into hip-hop and basically just listening to us hmm. and then around that time that's when low life was about hmm. and they were re they were popping you know like skinny man kalashnikov hmm. maestro verb t just all them guys so we discovered them and then we were passing the cds around one of my mates started writing bars and so i just started writing bars for fun and yeah i grew up i don't know there's probably like 15 of us or 20 of us who like grew up in london and we would link up all the time and literally like we'd just go out get a little bit drunk go back to someone's house and like we would just freestyle literally for yeah. hours like Shit. it was like a thing that we did every single weekend for like man so many years That's just sick. like that freestyling and like i'm the only guy who like everyone rapped like loads of my mates were pretty sick rappers and that but like mm. they just didn't carry it on like seriously and out of all the people that were spitting were you the one that went on to actually do something then yeah yeah everyone everyone stopped like i've got a super oh, early tape of mine actually with me, me and one of my mates like that we put out on just like on a cd or whatever so like super super underground stuff to have does it does it still stand up does it stand up like the bars yeah yeah the bars are all right man yeah it's a bit <laughs> a little bit ropey but yeah <laughs> that's fine no, man rough around the edges sometimes that's quite good i enjoy that that's weird yeah. thing, mate so when do you know you're spitting you, you do it like i love that idea of it because it is that simple pleasure when you're a kid get a little yeah. bit fucked up and just get a mic and just spit that's all you needed right mm. like, yeah, it's just for the fart like it was just fun and obviously we'd write verses but most of the time that's what i liked about hit you know what i like about hip-hop you know freestyling i feel that that mm. has been that's been lost a lot you know like now mm. someone rapping bars over an instrumental that's not original like just a random beat mm. and they're just rapping bars that's called a freestyle now but yeah you know my ogs like us you know we know that's not a freestyle, that a freestyle. that's not the real definition of a freestyle <laughs> like, i don't i don't that's remember just, that's just bars yeah i don't remember the last time i went out and i saw a proper freestyle mm. like youtube yeah you see him now and again but i, I just don't remember yeah. that do you still do, yeah. do you still practice do you still practice your freestyling yeah man I, I still do i still do like to myself and you know occasionally yeah with the right mates had, had a couple drinks or whatever have a little freestyle and oh, stuff mate, or... you gotta put that shit out man you gotta put yeah. that shit out <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for real. it's another thing that intrigues me is do you remember mm. that first validation then that you were good like do you remember when you i don't know what was the one that really meant something to you You're like, oh my god like people actually think that i'm good at spitting so basically like um I grew up around South London in Herne Hill, um, you know, right next to Brixton. Jam bar still about, still good. We do events there, like occasionally still to the state. But mm. um, they had a, like a really long running night called Speaker's Corner that was put on. I remember that. Um, yeah, by DJ Snuff. And I think a couple of other guys were involved in it. Mm. But for me, man, that was like the mecca of UK hip hop. I can't remember how regular it was. I think it was maybe every couple of weeks or at mm. least every month. But like, for years, I went there as like a diehard fan. I just loved it, you know, like even if my other mates wouldn't come down, I'd just like roll down there and just like, you know, meet meeting people on the scene, mm. you know, meeting producers, MCs and stuff. And um, they used to have like an open mic competition. And um, I went down there when I got a bit of confidence. I think it was like one of the first times that I ever rapped on stage with a mic. And, and they had like an open mic competition. There's like a few... Uh, you know, a few judges or whatever names in the scene at the time. And anyway, I won the competition. 
and the prize was like some studio time. Um, yeah, I went to, I got to go and use like a professional recording studio for the first time and, you know, record my first ever track on, a, on you know, on a decent mic. And, and that is, that track actually is on the first tape that I was, I was telling you about. Oh my days. So yeah, that was, and then from that point I was like, yeah, you know what, if I can, if I could win that competition and get studio time, like mm. I've got, I've got a little something here and it was just a passion for it, man. Just mm. Where does that come from for you then? Like, you know, when you got into mm. rap and you were fully in. Like, what could you find in that that you couldn't find anywhere else? Like, for me, uh, basically, when I was really young, I got into skating and I used to go skating up in the city like loads. And so, when you're doing that, you're seeing commuters hmm. every all the time because we would go up to the city of London 99% of the time, they're all on the train looking super miserable. <laughs> and and uh, and I always just thought, I'm not going to be one of you guys, like, I'm hmm. never going to be one of you. Like, I decided that when I was like 13. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, man. I love the culture in hip hop, you know, how it's got mm. all the different elements and stuff. And then through being around that, quite a lot of the skaters are into graffiti and stuff. And um, one mm. of my best mates' brothers was doing quite a lot of graffiti. Uh, so we, so I got into that. I got pretty heavily into that. Ended up painting a lot. And then I actually got like arrested uh, oh. in the train yard for it and it went through some shit and got my house raided and all, all that Damn, sort of crap. Shit. And then after that, and then around the same time, um, a couple one of my mates had been arrested and actually ended up doing some time because he was kind of prolific and then like another whole big group of graffiti writers who i was like who i knew basically all got bagged and and loads of them went down Mm. and around that same time i was writing a lot of lyrics and i just like when you get your house raided and you have to put your family through that shit i was only 16 at the time you know what i mean which is which is real young and we were just doing you know it's just kids being kids really Mm. and um but yeah, that that for me then, like going through that stress, I was like, I love, I love being creative and I love channeling that mm. energy. I, I, I don't want to go to prison for this yeah, stuff. Yeah, do you yeah. know what I mean? I'm writing lyrics and I'm loving that. And I get, this, I was getting the same enjoyment from writing lyrics, recording the song and listening to it as mm. I did getting some cans, you know, doing my sketches, going out, like doing the track side or whatever. You know, it's a different buzz, but it gave, it gave me that same sort of like gratification, you know, like in my soul or whatever. Like, I don't know, it's like feeding the soul, the gratification. Course, I don't know, like, so then once that happened, I was like, I love graph, but I'm not going to do it illegally. I want to do this rap stuff. And, and, and it was starting to go well for me. So I was like, I can see a path here where I can be creative. I can feed that, like, you know, that drive and, and then also make a career out of it and then not be one of them sad commuters on yeah, the train. Yeah, yeah. man. They're big up on that. That's a huge thing. At that age as well. I don't remember at yeah. that age me knowing what I wanted to do in life. So yeah. I, I appreciate that you had that kind of focus. Mm. That time when you had that much focus and like energy to put into it, what, mm. were, what were your fam saying? Like, what was, what was mum and dad and like all, all those guys saying? Like, when you were like, do you know what? I actually want to do this like as my living with it with it was there like a lot of support there uh yeah yeah there was always a lot of support man i think that made a big difference you know like when i was pressing up force with imagery you know to press it up like i made a thousand cds back then it was like 500 quid i didn't have that money do you know what i mean like mm. so i had that my mum lent me lent me the money to get oh, my man. cd done and I, and I paid her back slowly, like, you know, going <laughs> yeah. out selling them after every show, like giving her yeah. another 20 quid or whatever. But Mate. that does make a big difference. And um, when I was doing some of my earlier live performances, like my dad helped me, like, you know, get the footage off the camera and get it onto the computer and Mate, that's sick, just little man. things like that, that that makes a big difference. Um, back then, they would probably just thought it was a hobby. I doubt they expected it to, to go on to how it did, you know, but yeah, they were yeah. always always supportive that's you know? good man so when you were out there now you're spitting doing your thing the name tell me about the name man like what was your first mc name i'd like to know that first do you remember your first you know what? it's actually mad yeah because what, my name my mc name has always been flip tricks basically there's not much of a tale yeah it's like i recorded <laughs> my first i recorded my first ever song Mm. and then i bounced it out or i was bouncing it out and it was like say file and i was like i had the name for the song but i was like oh shit i need a name mm. and like my name is xander but for some reason i was like oh, i could call myself z boy and i was like mm, <laughs> no nah. and i was like flip tricks yeah i like flip tricks like, i'm flipping lyrical tricks or whatever like i got what? all the flows and then i was just like yeah flip tricks just typed it in and then bang that's that's how, that's, how that's my amazing name. what that's wicked that's brilliant Were there any lyrics back in the day in the nineties that you just Mm. think, do you know what? I wish I'd written that. And it can't, it can't be uh, the big pun one that you already said. Mm, Yeah, it definitely is. It definitely is. Um, I think it's gotta be, 
probably something like I don't know Big L put it on man like oh. that, that that for me did it to get me pretty gassed back in the day damn yeah it's the way he was menacing as well man his mm. voice oh mate is there a track that you wish you could have featured on then yeah yeah I'll probably say like the Fuji's Fu- uh, Fuji La like I mm. listen to that now, like and obviously that's a group, so there's three voices on there, so I could yeah. slip in there somewhere. <laughs> Get in there, man. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I could hear that. I could hear that. Definitely on the remix. Yeah, man. Yeah. Love it. Hey, yo, yo, yo. This your boy, Frau March. And right now, you are rocking live with the Crate 808 podcast. Enjoy this week's episode. And just remember to subscribe and rate and review. Peace. So we talk about like uh, you pressing your album. That's was, that's MySpace days, right? MySpace was around back then. Yeah, in the first album, yeah, that was MySpace days, yeah. Mm. And then when you went on from that, how did you even just start with High Focus? Actually, I have a listener question on this, actually. Mm. So um, is it true yeah. that High Focus was your last year uni project or did you spot a gap in the market before setting it up? And that's from DJ Rogue from Bristol. Yeah, basically, I had some mates who were in Brighton. So I ended up moving to Brighton. I was doing a bit of just a bit of work down here, like flyering and, and um, involved a little bit in events and stuff. And um, then I went to, there was like a government funded uh, music college called Access to Music, which actually like Dizzy Rascal went to that in London and, and quite a few people okay. came up through Access to Music. So I just wanted to learn more about music production, recording and mics and stuff like that. So I did a two year course. I was at college when I created high focus it wasn't part of the course at all it's completely separate i thought right i'm gonna make my own label to release my own music That's so amazing. i literally just sat there thinking what am i gonna call this label i think of a good name i'd search it it was taken i think of a good oh, name no. search it, it was taken yeah. going through that process i thought high focus search it it's not taken i was like yes that's a sick like <laughs> that's a sick one like yeah. do you know what i mean basically once i had the name i then uh registered it like to protect the like the copyright of mm-hmm. the name i hit up my friend uh but who made the who made the high focus logo um yeah then when i was at college i was like you know what do i need to do what are the steps you know they're like register with with prs register with ppl to get the royalties you know just giving me a few little you know tips and and hints along the way but essentially uh every single thing you know to do with high focus has has just been done i'm learning along the way no one taught me how to run a label no one taught me that's mad. anything no one gave me a penny to finance mm. it like, every single thing to do with the label has been done like just like off off that's like a, that's a proper punk attitude to it. I love that. I, I got into high focus quite late, I think. Cause like, I think it, it was around, yeah, like 2014, 2015. I started really getting into like listening to yeah. a lot of the stuff. When I um, heard it though, it gave me a proper 90s feel. Yeah. I was like, wow, the, the music alone, it just feels like 90s to me. Was there a label in the 90s that kind of inspired you? I know Low Life had come before, or was there, was there a label that made you think, you know what, I can do this? I'd say the main inspiration for, you know, for High Focus was low life. Mm-hmm. And when you mentioned like a gap in the market, when High Focus came in, there definitely was a gap in the market because at that point, low life was crumbling. I think Brain Tax had done his shit and, and like, fucked off to Australia or, <laughs> or, wherever, or wherever he is. And um, one thing which is actually funny, yeah, you can go look this up. And I, I was I was happy when I, when I saw this in a way. One of Brain Tax's last interviews, you can look it up. Mm. There's a question in there and it's something along the lines of like, do you think another person could come along or like a group of people and set up a, a UK hip hop record label and it would be successful and they'd be able to do it? And he, his reply was in, in a word, no, or something <laughs> like that. And I was like, when I, that's mad, you know, like, so when I felt like, you know, cause he obviously created the label and stuff. So I was looking around for some interviews and when I found out, I was like, ha ha, proof you wrong, mate. You know what I mean? They, um, no, you killed it though. That's the thing. It's like, I've heard a lot of things about how, how you all came together, but was it really genuinely just like a mates all together? It was so organic. Like, um, so I think it was MySpace days. Like you say, I'd heard Jam Baxter on MySpace. I'd mm. heard Leaf Dog on MySpace. Uh, I came to Brighton, uh, one time just for a weekend, ended up going to some free party in a field, you know, with like speakers and, yeah, and yeah. that. And Jam Baxter was there. We ended up meeting, um, and having a freestyle that night and, mm, um, and swap num and like, and then like swap numbers and then and then linked up i became friends with him um he was he already knew leaf dog um 
So I got linked into them. Um, Dirty Dyke also around that time, he he'd actually spent like a little time inside and then he didn't rap before he went in. But Mr. Key, uh, who's like one of the original Contact Play mm. members, did rap and was like the freestyle king as well, like back in the day. Uh, OK. And um, he inspired Dyke to start writing bars when he was in prison. And then when he got out, he came to Brighton. And that's where I met Dyke in Brighton. And that was when they were making the first Contact Play album. Um, and I remember quite a lot of that album was actually already made. And James came out and had started rapping and mm. ended up vocaling loads of the tunes and becoming a member and contact play all properly like formed onto there um you know formed that whole group mm -hmm. and um so obviously when i met leaf dog he he rolled with beaver all the time i met verb t um when i did a show in wandsworth um i was a support for him and Kashmir, and they saw me perform they were like they thought i was good and we linked up there and that's how he did the first feature on um Forceful imagery back in 2007. Him and Kashmir like brought me on the road, uh, started taking me to like loads of their uh, early shows. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, yeah, yeah. back in the day, you know, just getting like a little bit of cash, you know, just to see perhaps to be out there. And they'd bring me out, do do like <laughs> a few tunes or whatever in their show. And um, that's weird. Yeah, it just the whole label built so organically. I think the only literally. I'm just bringing up the roster now because there's literally like 25 <laughs> people, but yeah. it was pretty much like Coops was one of the first people that I saw who was completely outside of the circle. And I was just like, this guy is fucking sick. Mm. Like, you know, the, his content, his flow, his style, mm. his choices of beats. I felt like everything that he was doing fitted so well with the label, mm. but he was like off on a different kind of scene you know in a whole different circle of friends or our paths hadn't crossed so he was dropping all his music on like grime daily and link up tv and sbtv which weren't maybe you know the best target audience for the mm. sound that he was creating that's it. so i just hit him up on twitter and was like yo you know what you saying man really feel your stuff i run this label like check it out um and then you know he hit me back and was like oh, i'm actually working on a project been thinking about what to do with it so i went down and met him at the studio in hackney and we had quite a few link ups and then signed to the label and put out a few mm. projects i think that's why high focus you know it is like there is a big family vibe to it mm. there is a big crew sort of feeling there and yeah. obviously there's loads of like collabs that have happened throughout the years all within the label which i think has helped give it that power you know like power yeah. in numbers like you know united we're, str man. we're stronger you know absolutely and this is it this is for the the listeners who are out there and maybe only you listen to us stuff or or our mm. us listeners who don't know much about the uk rap scene everyone bangs on about griselda everyone bangs on about these uh, and, and they have done amazing work as units mm. But to mm. see um, where you guys have been from 2010 and how natural it's all seemed to have come across, that's and, and also how you've adapted to the shifting kind of industry, I suppose. Like, yeah. you started MySpace, man. That, you started when you that was happening. So there's been a massive shift. Yeah. When you look at streaming, for, for someone who's got a label, how yeah. is that? Like, is that? Is that good or bad? Like, how do you see it? Streaming, well, yeah, basically, it's interesting when you look at, like, uh, the generation. So the low-life generation, that was before, like, social media and Facebook mm. and YouTube and stuff like that. And then our generation was when, like, YouTube was coming out, Facebook, all the social media. So I think we're quite lucky in that sense because of the exposure. And I got onto it straight away and I was like, these are great tools. I'm going to utilize them. I made the wicked. channel set up the stuff and really pushed it i'm a massive fan of physical products like when you pour your heart and soul into an album over however long a period it takes for you to make it mm. for me to hold it on a tangible format you know ideally vinyl but cd and tape is cool as well mm -hmm. like that for me makes it special that makes it more real mm. and you know it's going to last in the history who knows what's going to happen like to the internet do you know what i mean maybe one day the internet will be down but if you put out loads of vinyls like yeah. guys are going to have them in their collection 20 30 years from now when high focus might not even be about or whatever some guy's going to be flicking through a crate and find this yeah these gems and i just feel like it makes it more you know a it just solidifies thing, right? yeah it's more tangible um so yeah. then, yeah, when the internet came around, obviously, firstly, it was like illegal downloads popped off and the music industry did kind of shit themselves because yeah. they didn't, we're so used to selling tons of, of, of physical units. And then as soon as the internet comes about and all these illegal download sites, the physical sales drop off massively mm. and everyone's getting this stuff ripped. 
I think a lot of people sort of resented that at a while and it took a little while for people to adjust and you need to think cleverly about how mm. can I monetize this situation? That's when you need to start looking into merchandise or making your vinyl look even more special so it becomes collectible yeah. and limiting it or signing it. And there's a lot of ways to make money and there's so many different pockets and mm. things can change. So you, you always need to move with the times and, and, and be adaptable, you know, like mm. I know I've seen, I've seen artists and I've seen labels and people, um, you know, try and reserve themselves and not go on streaming platforms because they feel that, you know, it's not getting, yeah. they're not getting what they should be getting and it shouldn't be like that. But overall, I think that's been a loss. It's been a loss because I, we want, you want to make music so people can hear it and how, and you can get to the furthest, you know, the furthest reach and, and let people enjoy your creations, you mm. know. Yeah, I, I took streaming on. Um, you know, it would be nice if Spotify gave you more more money per play. But <laughs> yeah, like, for sure, but for sure. At the end of the day, it's about people hearing the music, and you know, mm. it's a great service. I use Spotify every day. Most of my music, I do stream. If I really love an album, then I'll go and and mm. cop the vinyl or uh, and and go to the shows and yeah. and support the artists in that way. You know. Yeah, exactly. But at least, but streaming has kind of deaded out the illegal downloads so at least now yeah. we can see the numbers of our staff we can you know if things get playlisted that can help a lot financially and you know at least the artist is getting money so yeah. streaming has helped you say now you use spotify every day though before we move on what what, what have you got bumping at the moment uh a lot of rock marciano um sick. yeah his new his new album is sick i'm a big fan yeah um, that track puff daddy is fucking killer love that track yeah it's banging um conway the machine mm -hmm. um listening to a lot of him uh benny the butcher as well sweet um i like wiki as well yeah um from rat king i don't know if rat king are doing stuff as a group but um, i i was always into wiki i'm feeling his new album i think um, he's touring i think i saw something about him touring i don't know i'm not sure but yeah i mean yeah, rat, he rat is. King were great but yeah yeah, Wiki's to is is touring. Um, also, Earth Gang. I'm, I, I really like Earth Gang. Oh, stuff. do you like Earth Gang? They're interesting. Yeah. It's an interesting sound. I don't know. Mm. I kept thinking Outcast. I don't know. I kept when I heard it. Yeah, they time. are. They have an Outcasty vibe. I just really into. Um, you know, I think in music and in rap and stuff like there's a lot of content that is like I don't know, not not that great. You know, and I feel <laughs> the Earth yeah. Gang. Like I'm about. I'm um, for me personally, like I like listening to hood rap. Man's mm. talking about shit you know, that goes down on the streets and that. But then I yeah, also, yeah. I love, you know, for me, my music, you know, I like to put out a positive message and, and, mm. and um, make that sort of music. So Sweet. Earth Gang are pretty, you know, they're quite conscious lyricists. They have a lot of good concepts and topics and it's a bit different. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, man. The, 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 that's, I mean, I, I'd love that. I need to hear more about this album that you guys have dropped uh, mm. at some point. But before we do, I just want to ask, because because we're there talking about the label and how it's changed and how you listen to it mm. different, music differently and stuff like that. Uh, there was one interview I actually read, I think, of, of yours where it was, um, you said the UK supports its own a lot more nowadays. Um, yeah. And I was just wondering, in your opinion, at what point, do you think the attitude changed in this country where the UK actually did start supporting its own a lot more? I think it was when, um, you know, I think it's, it's been a journey, but I think people like Dizzy Rascal, um, I think he helped a lot. Mm. Even guys like, you know, Professor Green, when he come on and did all the jump off stuff and then yeah. started getting onto the radio more. I think when we were young, mm. people thought rap, only Americans can do it. It was like someone from England raps, ha, that like laughable. Mm when people from our country started making it yeah. and then it became popular and it started to get on the radio, people from the country started to accept it. So I think there was like an acceptance mm. first. And then obviously the grime scene, like I think hip hop and grime has like merged a lot more now, like the sounds and even mm. the artists, you know, the whole culture of, of rap, you know, music has grown a lot more in the, in this country. So I think it, it kind of started around then. And I think as time's gone on, it's just become more and more accepted, more and more widespread, more mm. artists have realized you can make a living from it, started doing it. And just as a country, we've stepped up our sort of professionalism, you know, how mm. artists are doing all their own tours and, you know things like that and it's it's just slowly changed over time i think if when we were young if you were to ask like some kids on the street who are your favorite rappers probably all of them would have been american and then now if we were just to go outside like brixton tube station for example and and say to like a 17 18 year old kid who's your top 10 rappers i wouldn't be surprised if nearly all like mm. you know of them were from the uk do yeah. you know what i mean yeah absolutely like, 
And then also the fact that we're creating so much good stuff and it's being supported so much. Look, people from the US, you know, even just guys like Drake or whatever, you know, loving it so much. Mm. And that is actually helping shed light on our scene. I mean, yeah. the, well, the beautiful thing about that is, though, when you say like all these youngsters uh, and their favourite MCs might be UK MCs, mm. I see videos of you and like Skinny Man and I'm yeah. like, the generational thing here is massive because it's a yeah. new track, but Skinny's in there, you're in yeah. there. First of all, big up. So I love that relationship. Yeah. But how did that? Yeah. How did that even start, man? How did that even start with Skinny Man? Well, like, yeah, literally, man. I've, he was a massive inspiration to me. He was one of my favorite artists growing up. Like, Council State of Mind. I, I gave that Classic. album heavy rotation, and mm. and all of his features. He's just so charismatic. Um, his content, his message. He's just a and he's a great character, man, and 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 a, a really big energy mm. uh, to be around. So I've always been a fan of him. You know, uh, over the years I met him at a few shows that we we're performing. We ended up being on the same with a few few of the same lineup. So you know, we bumped heads there. We did some four hour shows that he was there, and he was like, "Right, you know, these guys oh, are they're doing their thing." You know, like he, he, yeah. he was feeling what we we're doing. So basically, um, and then when I was creating my new album uh, in Excel, I made the tune Thriller. And mm. that actually did have a second verse on it originally. Oh, okay. Um, so, and then I was just listening to it. I was like, I can really hear Skiddy on this. Like, yeah. I could just hear him on it. So I was like, I hit up Kima. I was like, delete my second verse and and send me it with a with a gap. And I sent the beat to him, and he was just like, yeah, this is fire. Like, and and um, Killed yeah, he it. checked the bars, and, and and he was loving it. And um, I was like, oh, it would be a real honor, you know, for, for for you to be on my my new album. And he was just like, yeah, man, I'm down. Um, I actually had quite a short deadline of like two or three weeks that I needed to turn around the verse on. And mm. um, I think I'd actually forgotten about it. And he hit me up like, yo, don't you need the verse? Like, <laughs> you no, know, it's like ready or whatever. So um, yeah, I went to, I went down to North London and linked up with uh, Pete Cannon at um, mm. his, the studio, The Labrador, which him and Dirty Dyke share. Yeah, Skinny come round and and linked up and, and recorded uh, the verse That's sick. together. Yeah, it's funny actually. He got there and because I did, I can't remember. I think I did like a twenty-four bar or something. He came with a with a sixteen bar prepped, and he was like, "Oh shit, you've actually done longer." So <laughs> he sat there and wrote, wrote the last eight bars in like 10, 15 minutes. Do you know what I mean? Oh and then snap! Just, That's hop, hop, hopped on the mic and um yeah we and then we made the tune and there was always a plan to do a video. Yeah, it didn't it didn't like our ideas and the camera people who were gonna do it, it wasn't working out. And then um above ground like hit me up, who's one of like my favourite video directors, and mm. he was like, Um, yeah, I'm gonna be in the UK if you need anything, you know, doing quick time and I had uh we had like a high focus show that night. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just helped Skinny and be like, Above ground can do a video, like should we do it? And he was like, Yeah, come to my flat and the whole thing was just pretty much like freestyled out in the day. But That's like wicked. I said, Skinny's got he's got that energy and that and that character and charisma and it just came off in the video man you're like yeah definitely you're like in the van and shit all squashed <laughs> up and spitting <laughs> it's like that reminded me of a time and i didn't get to go but um the dirty dike gig uh where <laughs> dirty dike like, brings a fucking caravan on stage and shit and you're like yeah geez man like this is what i mean the culture man it's not just all about streaming is it like going no. to see someone live and then doing that the music videos yeah man i'm mm. here for all of it man Yo, yo, just a quick break from the conversation. One, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Flip Tricks again, smashing it. Four hours, new shit coming soon. Go check that out. Uh, before we move on, just to remind you all about our Crate 808 Pen and Pixel competition. Uh, harking back to my conversation with Luke James, legend. Uh, we talked about Warren G's Regulate album. And yeah, in the bants, we decided what we should do is get people to do rap alternate covers of classic albums but in a pen and pixel style uh, so yes we've had some entries they are amazing i'm not gonna lie i've been giggling to myself about those so yeah big up those people who have already put in the time and effort and thrown us some mock-ups uh, anyone else out there who wants to do it this is your chance to win some crate 808 merch uh, on that tip it will be coming on the website we will be selling some merch at some point uh, just about getting that shit up man and on 
obviously you can win some if you apply for the pen and pixel competition. So send all your applications to create 808 at gmail.com or you can uh, tweet us at create 808 or you can hit us on Instagram at create underscore 808 and also just check us out on create808.com for all that other good stuff. Either way, go out there, rate, review, subscribe, go on to iTunes, give us a little rap review, all that good shit, tell a friend, tell a friend, we're growing and we can only do it with your help. Anyway, let's get back to the conversation with Flip Freaks. We need to go into the new album. April the 17th, it drops. Come on, man, tell me more about it. What 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 drove you guys, first of all, to get back in the studio? I think, man, it's like, um, with the Owls, it's really funny how how it all formed. Um, in 2011, like, Leaf Dog, I just signed him for the Scare, from a Scarecrow's Perspective album. He mm. came to London to shoot a video and was like, can I bring my mate Beaver? I was like, yeah, cool, man, bring him down. Um, came to my flat in Camberwell. You know, after the video shoot, we're like, oh, let's make some tunes. We ended up making, like, four tunes. And then, because um, I just recently linked up with Verbs, I was like, oh, let's get him on it. Nice. Originally, it was just us three, and then we and then we brought Verbs in. Yeah, we were just smoking loads of like weed or whatever, and Cypher said, I've got a tune called Burn Another Owl. So we're like, yeah, we're burning the owls, we're burning the owls. <laughs> Hold on, what's that track by Cypher? So I've never heard that track. Burn Another yeah. Owl, wicked. Oh. Yeah, so like Beaver was listening to that, so he's like, "We're burning the owls, we're burning the owls," and I was just like, "We are, we're the owls," and like, yeah, it was <laughs> just, that. it was just like fun. Like we made the first album in like two weeks. Like we just chose all the beats, decided a, a concept for each song, went away, and then met up like two weeks later, recorded it. It was just so easy. Like we had no idea what was going to happen. And then we put it, we, you know, we made it a mystery. I was like, oh yeah, I came up with the concept of like, because we're all known as solo artists, I wanted to change it. So I was like, let's brand it with the, with the owls, let's put masks on, let's give ourselves like um, alias, you know, names or whatever. And then, yeah, it just built a mystery and, and, and people just felt that energy that did really well and we ended up touring like a lot around Europe and the UK and that put on the pressure for this for the second project the second album was Natural Order which dropped four years later mm. in 2015 um, and yeah we made a ton of songs for that we we set the bar we set the bar really high so because we really you got some sick that. collabs on there as well for that one right yeah man yeah the biggest one on there was the uh, the DJ Premier link up man that was sick that's absolutely sick man like yeah and that's a that's a wicked track doing the DJ Premier collab took us to a whole new level exposed us to so many people who had never heard of us you know our show fee just like instantly went up do you know what I mean like shit loads more it was, it was, it was it that big an impact it was I mean it's premiere isn't it but like yeah it was a massive it was a, it made a big difference for us specifically out in Europe because in places like Greece you know Austria um you know they love boom bap hip hop they love it so much so mm. like you know we did that collab and that exposed us to those markets you know we became popular over there and ended up doing like a lot of touring not long after that we decided to start making this third album and it's literally taken us like <laughs> with like five years it's Damn. five years five years man but what, yeah. is this, what what can we expect then because i know you've all done your solo stuff and you know you've all kind yeah. of creatively expressed yourselves in a lot of different ways what can we expect man what can we expect from the new record like i think yeah the fans are going to be real happy man it's like you know it's with the hours we like to, we bring that real sound it's that raw boom bap it's all produced by leaf dog by one tune again which we've got the legendary dj premiere on oh Jeez. snap you got a, you got so a whole new track new premiere track coming up yeah yeah we've got a new primo joint Jeez, okay i'm here for that i'm here for that i can't believe you're like so just chilled about it as well yeah just like yeah just I know, got, I know, just got primo on doing the track that's crazy yeah <laughs> that's wicked but it was like a li- that was like a lifelong dream um for everyone but you know specifically leaf dog like he worked so hard to make that first connect happen mm. on the first album mm. so once that happened um you know the second time around it was so much easier because we'd done the whole process before you know and what i really liked about that is you know a lot of people he premier was fans of us like there's like a, a magazine that front magazine i don't know if it's still about it anymore but um mm. there was an interview with primo and he was asked like who are some UK MCs that he likes to look out for or whatever and he name dropped Kalashnikov Leaf Dog and myself that's crazy so, like, that's yeah crazy. when we saw that I was like we're all like sick like he, he's into it and um and he he actually had a radio show that I'm pretty sure he spanned some of the first uh, Owls album on so we knew it was familiar so when we made that that connect you know he was down because he represents that like, real hip hop the same as the, as the Owls yeah 
and it was just cool because instead of just being you know like the beat costs x amount and just like sending it it wasn't like that like you know he called up leaf dog leaf's like oh shit i'm getting a call from premier you know what i mean and like chatted to him all about the song and like what we would want from the song and the type of you know beat and tempo and Mm. and like vibe that we're going for and they just had a really good chat and then um you know he made he cooked up um a couple beats for us and we ended up going for the second one and yeah, man, he did the cuts and, and then he came through with the intro, um, you know, like for him doing that vocal intro and getting that extra sample in there and mm. and, and doing all the cuts um, just That's really like, solidified it as like, you know, he really cares about it and he's passionate and he wanted to make the best song like for us. Mm. And, and he's done that. He's done it again this time. This time, you know, he's, he's he really came through with, with, with a great with a great beat. And and that's nice, you know, when you know that they care about it. Yeah. Um, and he had like a headline show in London uh, I think at Kentish Town Forum I think it was mm. and yeah he invited us backstage we were, we went and met him we met him before actually at Outlook Festival but he we, we met him again in London and we gave him copies of the, of the single and, oh, and the goodness. album on vinyl and got some photos and just hung out with him for a while and that is sick. It's, it's, it's nice when you know like a hero and, and a living legend that you look up to that you get to work with but also embraces you like it in in that way you know and, and it's for the it's for the love um mm. you know obviously there's business involved but it's it's everyone's job you know what i mean so, yeah of course that man. Was, that's that wicked. Good, man. I, do, I, do, I do actually remember i think that gig at kentish town you warmed up for him right because i think yeah, I, was, yeah, I, was, yeah. I was at that show yeah i remember that because you guys i was yeah, like shit yeah. man they they because i knew you'd done a track but to see yeah. you warming up with him i was like yeah it makes complete sense but fair play to him mate they're like you know warming up for primo that's amazing yeah so on the album have you done any is there more collabs come in or is it, it what how have you how have you gone about it it's funny we've actually got quite a heavy uh us kind of lineup it, it, okay it just it, it just pa- ended up panning out like that it wasn't like something that we premeditated from the start mm-hmm. but yeah man we've got um right at the start of creating the album we've been doing some shows and ra the rugged man was at, at them and oh he stop was the, it yeah yeah he was feeling the energy and um and was like yo let's i can't remember i think leaf sent him a beat and um it's like a real it's got quite a fast pace to it and it's like like it's really lively and and we i think leaf had done a vocal on it and we sent it to ra and it was just like this shit's fire and um yeah like a couple weeks later we had like the most ridiculous sick verse from him in our inbox and we're like yes bro you know he's amazing fair play such a small world now man you can just do that it's wicked yeah, so that was sick. And then, um, yeah, we got Rock Marciano on another giant. Rock, mate. Come on, man. You can't <laughs> strop it like that. Rock Marciano. If people who listen to this podcast, they know my love for Rock Marciano is on healthy mm. levels. Like, <laughs> I remember, I would think we had a debate and I argued in the last 10 years, he's a more influential rapper than Jay-Z. And I was getting yeah. taken apart a little bit. <laughs> but I'm holding tight on that claim, man. That's my take. That's my take. He's, Real, yeah, that's he's- a, his output is unreal. So how is it mm. like working with him? How did you link that up? That was Leaf Dog. So Leaf, um, you know, he's he loves to work with all of his his heroes. You know, mm. um, so he actually connected with Rock Mars. Um, I think it was when they did a joint together on the, on the Crud Lord album. Mm-hmm. Um, and then basically, yeah, we he he ended up getting a verse from him and on a killer beat, and then all of the owls uh, ended up hopping on the track and 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 turning that into like um, you know, four hours rock, rock master collab, sweet, basically. Sweet, mate, that's um, wicked. Mm, but yeah, he's a, he's a real favourite of, of mine as well, man. I, I listen to a lot of a lot of his stuff, man. Yeah, man. If you if you go in favourite Marcy project, what you got? Oh, it's, it's it's tough. I mean, obviously, Marsberg for me, mm. that was what really put me onto him. Were you um, on that? Were you on that? Like when it when it came out, I was late to it. I didn't know how because it's like, that's like twenty ten, isn't it? Twenty eleven, something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It was 2010 that when that came out. I think I might have discovered it a little bit later, but there was. Mm. There, I remember the time distinctively. There was quite a buzz about him in the UK. It was almost like a load of people just kind of discovered him, mm. like at this kind of time. And that was, um, yeah, probably around maybe 2012 or something like that. Because um, he was, yeah, he was with Flip Mode before that. It's so odd to think he was with Flip, but Flip Mode. It's like, yeah, yeah, in the UN, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Reloaded. I, I like that album a lot as well, man. Reloaded was was, was real nice. Yeah, that's um, sick, man. Uh, that that yeah, I, I I go with that. I, I enjoyed his projects. I think they're from 2018 where he dropped mm. two. I can't remember the album names. I'm awful with album names, but the one with yeah. the purple cover and oh fucking hell, man. Yeah, such a good album. Yeah, yeah. 
so behold a dark horse that one is that's yeah. the one boom that's the one yeah man yeah yeah sick just sick mm. definitely and his new one as well man really really enjoying the new yeah, album yeah it's a bit different man it's a bit different mm. I, I, yeah. what I'm here for in that kind definitely that kind of rap like Doom was like the first guy I got into properly from the underground I, I would I would think and then like mm. as as I went like over the years I got into Car first and yeah 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 when I like when I heard him on the last Rock Marciano project, mm. I just need them two to just do a collab. Like, just do. No, where, where's he gone? Where's he? Uh, he hasn't been put cars <laughs> too much, man. But when That's he does, when he comes out, when he drops a feature, it's like, oh fuck, we need him. So mm. I'm here for like a seven, eight track just EP with them two. Be great, and uh, you boys just feature on one of the tracks. I just, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> Let's do that, man. Sounds good to me, man. Sounds good to me. <laughs> so, what else with the album? Then, like, is is it uh, is it like a big project? Is it like how many tracks are you looking at here? Uh, yeah, we got 14, 14 tracks. Okay, um, we made a, we made a lot more. We made probably around thirty or something, and we slimmed it down. It would nearly came out at eighteen songs, and then. Um, Right at the last minute, we ended up taking four tunes off it. But we, we're going to put out another thing later because we've actually ended up collecting quite a lot of uh, songs over the years. So oh, you, nice. They probably will come out. There probably will be at some time some sort of four hours lost tapes type vibe, hopefully, <laughs> yeah. or a little EP or, or like a deluxe version of that album or something, or, or something yeah. like that. We wanted to make, try and make a classic album, you know, and at the moment it comes in at 55 minutes, like just under an hour. And mm. the whole piece as a body of work works really well. And we like to have quite a lot of tracks with concepts and meaning mm. behind them, you know, not just bars. So like a few of the tunes that didn't go on there were just, you know, just rapping about rapping. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, for sure. Just for bars. Sure. Like, so we could, obviously we, there's, there's bars tunes on there, but there's a lot of concepts too. Yeah, we got another couple of classic, you know, got Master Killer from uh, Wu Tang and also Cool G, cool G Rap as well, man. Whoa, Cool G Rap. I've not heard yeah. anything from G Rap for a minute, I don't think. I don't I don't know, it's just not on my radar as much. I'd love to hear this. Was that just mm, the hip hop yeah, through Leaf Dog as well? Was that was that a. Uh, the Cool G Rap came through uh, Leaf Dog. And then with Master Killer, yeah, we're just massive fans of the Wu and wanted to work with him. And uh, sweet. Yeah, man, man to, to hook it up. And we've also got. Um, Smelling some piff from RLD, which is nice. beef and beef. Nice, uh, man. This looks sounds stacked. Was there a certain yeah, yeah. sound you were going for? I mean, I think yeah, there was definitely like Leaf. Um, you know, he's been imp- improving as you know as the years go on, as you do. You know, putting more time and effort into the craft, and um, mm. you know, he's got a slightly sort of new new kind of style with uh, some of his beats in a, in a way. Um, we have got a lot of energy on there. It's banging though, like, like it's, it. bang, it's it's a banger. Like yeah, I'm yeah. sure the fans are going to be happy with it. We spent a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of um, you know debates, and and the way we have it, it's like if all four members don't agree that a song is going to make it, it doesn't make it. So if oh. three of us are like, that's it's I love that song. If one's like, nah, like that means it goes in the bin. Like that is a lot of faith, man, in each other. Yeah. That's brilliant. So like everyone, so, you know, when you've got four guys been like, we're trying to make a classic and they all have to agree. So it means a lot, you know, the ones that make it, they are like, they're banging. No, oh, it's wicked, man. I like that process. When it comes out, mm. I'd love to hear more from you guys just to see like, you know, behind it a little bit in the process. I mean, the creative process mm. alone, what kind of yeah. creative are you when you come to this stuff? Because are you a patient guy where you agonize mm. over like lyrics and beats or? I mean, I guess I'll address it in like two ways because firstly, I'll talk about that, the way the creative process works with the hours and that's like, this is really important to me and I think this is what maybe certain, you know, groups or collectives can can lack some sometimes and, and I feel that with the hours you can hear it. So like mm. every, pretty much every single tune that we make, we've been in the room together. Like mm. we've been written those lyrics together we've recorded those bars together like we've we've done that so you've got that chemistry you've got that that feeling you know it's obviously we did little bits of writing at home and and have to lay a little you know redo that verse here and there and stuff but leaf lives in glastonbury so we went down there we had a good few sessions just like you know chilling at his house working on the album a couple times Mm. uh one time we we rented our house uh for like three or four nights and we just went down there brought all of our our setup like you know mike and a pop shield and 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 all the bits and just like set up in this airbnb and 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 just made tunes there and then i've got a studio in brighton um that they all came down to and verbs came down quite a few times Mm. 
And yeah, we just did it together. And I think that's why also it's taken so long because we all, all of us live in different parts of the country. We've all got a lot of responsibilities and things going on in our life. So we really have to set that time aside to, to make it happen. The Owls is so popular and we have so many fans, which like the music means a lot to. And I, I felt like a duty to, to provide for them. It's kind mm. of hard to describe, but like I, I didn't want to let them down. And even when it, you know, even mm. if things got like, hard with the group like oh yeah we you know we've got to do it and mm. and one of us being like you know there's a few times with the album where so you know me verbs and beaver have been like yeah the album's done and then leaf's like no nah, no nah, it's not like mm. we need to do like five more tunes and i'm thinking oh what we've got to do more mm. but then and then we do them and there's like yo you know what he was right mm-hmm. like some and he's like no nah, right i'm like the album's done he's like no nah, it's not we need another concept and I'm <laughs> yeah like, oh, yeah okay. yeah yeah, and, we, and and you do it, and I was like, yeah, you're you're right, and and through working in that process, I think that's why we just set the like the quality threshold that we set ourselves is really high. So mm. that's why it takes um, a while. Yeah. But I also feel that you know it kind of benefits us when people put out so much music all the time. Sometimes it it's hard to digest, or it's hard to keep up, or it's hard to give a, a project as much attention as it deserves. Mm. Whereas because I'm more spaced out, and we try and make classics, hopefully they can get like rotation for many years to yeah, come. You know? for sure, man. Yeah, you're right. People dropping like two, three albums a year nowadays, isn't it? Mm. So there's a lot of faith, a lot of trust, a lot of love in that man. Definitely, yeah. like. You know, I don't know many people who work like that generally, let alone a creative project. Do you know what I mean? So, and that's funny because that actually leads me into like my flip tricks creative process. Because for sure, for uh, sure. Because um, yeah, basically, mo- pretty much a large majority of time I write at night. Obviously, I run high focus every day, Monday to Friday. Mm. Um, you know, alongside Molotov, uh, big up to Molotov. You know, he's worked for the label for a real long time, and mm. and and he's a great producer as well. So you know, big shout out to him. And then, yeah, man, just like, you know, get home, just chill. I go to my studio. I hit up a load of producers for beats and I just have like a big folder in it on my iTunes, like beats to write to. And I just start flicking through them. Something will just catch me and then I'll just start like getting in the zone. And like some of the times almost like have the lights off or just like a really low light in the corner and I just pour up a zone in and like, you know, there is a channeling, there is a channeling type thing. And when you open like that channel and I just start like flowing and sometimes my hands just like, I write my bars on the computer and I'm just like, Rah, like it's just coming to me like sometimes it's fast you know what i mean and, yeah and, yeah and just yeah really get in the really just get in the zone so it's, it's a definite different it's a it's a different process uh mm. when you're working by yourself and also the lyrical content is is kind of different because you can just do you or be mm. you you don't have to consult with anyone else or yeah yeah you know? that's nice i suppose yeah because i suppose when you're solo as well though you you may need someone to check you which is probably why you need a good producer or a good friend even do you know what i mean just like a mate just to say to you actually yeah. maybe not or maybe you know go this way or whatever because you know being Definitely. creative yeah i mean mm. I, I think sometimes when you get swallowed in your own little like world it's a great yeah. thing but it's also like oh hold on a minute i might just need to not that i've written yeah. any any rapper ever mate i'm just saying you know <laughs> just just creatively trying to make anything like this podcast or whatever you know you can't get swallowed too much on your own on your own hype De- sometimes i think definitely definitely like i've got um chemo has like mixed and mastered like all of my projects so i, I, mm. I hold his opinion in real high regard so That's wicked. when i'm sending him stuff i ask him honestly and 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 you know he says oh no this one's not as strong or yeah. you know maybe work on that little bit and and I'll, and I'll take that on board you know so so you're going to be dropping a solo thing right yeah so um you know it's nearing completion like i said i'm having uh, my first child pretty soon so i'm trying yeah. to wrap my trying to wrap my album up creatively before mm. uh, before he comes along so yeah, um, yeah. so i've got that in in the bank in the bank so yeah take, so I can take some time off to to be with him you for know? sure man for sure it's a beautiful thing man Yo, what up, y'all? This is DJ Premier, and you're checking out the Crates 808 podcast. I put an S on it because there's more than one record in the crate, you know what I'm saying? So that's how we dig, that's how we play, and that's what real DJs do. You heard? That's why it goes down. We out here. We can't have gone this far in the conversation, mate, and I've not asked you, who are your top five MCs? Yeah, I know. Right? This is a, that is a, like it is a tough. Que- it is a tough question. Um, I, I apologise now. That I no, it's all good. <laughs> but I'm going to do like a little. It's some US and 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 UK in there. I think um, okay. I'd have to say Big L uh, as mm-hmm. one because um, his inspiration to me as a f- with his flows mm-hmm. was a big inspiration and for his punchlines. 
um yeah. and that's like you know when i was young it's, it, certain artists or certain songs you know just make an impact mm. with you so i feel big l for his you know for the flows and um like that and punchlines yeah the next one up from from america i would have to actually say rock marcy you know oh top five all time Shit, mate, it's, why like, not? It's really you know the reason why yeah i could i could name other people but for the you know for the last five six years i have been bumping his shit a lot like mm-hmm. when when i got my like spotify wrap up i'm pretty sure he was like right at the top or <laughs> yeah. artist of the year i think he was artist of the year who i listened to the most mm. so i just i love the way his voice is like so smooth and you know like some rap can be like a bit jarring to listen to like mm. he, he he just doesn't have that jarring sound it's just so it's just so easy uh yeah. on on the ear and like kind of soothing but but also with so much style and, and yeah. swagger swagger yeah yeah, definitely. He makes it in he's there. In. To be uh, fair, he's had enough output. At some mm. point, we've got to start talking like that because his output's ridiculous. Do you know what I mean? Just because, yeah. yeah, he's not got the big, big um, selling, you know, shows or whatever. Don't yeah. matter, man. He's, he's spitting fire, mate, for so long. And I think so many legends, like all of Wu and that, will all know of him. And even all that, the Griselda stuff, I know that, mm. you know, Wu-Tang are all back them. And, they're, you know, they're the guys coming through now who are really holding it down for real, mm. real mm. hip-hop. You know, if I was taking it back earlier, maybe I would say Method Man as a poet, you know, instead mm. of Rock Marcy. Mm. Uh, he was also a big inspiration to me, but I just feel I probably listen to more hours of, of Rock Marcy yeah, now. Man. Taste change, man. That's the beauty mm. of it as well, isn't it? Going into it, you, you change your change your taste. So that's your top. Yeah. So you've got two there. You've got three more spots, bro. Yeah. So yeah, my next one's definitely got, got to go to, uh, you know, a UK legend and, and pioneer, a massive inspiration uh, to me, which is Chester P. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, purely just for his like his lyricism, like he is a he's a poet, man. Like mm. it's so so poetic. Like you know, early tunes like Cosmic Gypsies. You know, I know there's features on there and stuff, but that, the mm. whole concept of it and yeah, just he's an amazing uh, writer. And for me, growing up, he inspired me a lot. And I always I, I always tried to write like deep bars. I don't know, like thoughtful stuff, and mm. really go in or like just try and push the boundary, not say, not say stuff that is is standard. And I don't know. No, he his creativity and and output like task force as a yeah. whole you know farmer g as well i love farmer g i've worked with both of them and that was a massive honor working with them guys so yeah i, so, I yeah. remember there was a um, what track is that now leaf dog track um i think it's called the legacy and yeah. that that track man when you've got um all you boys are on there with jest and uh, yeah, just, yeah. just the piece on that right i'm, I'm not being he's, yeah he's, yeah he's on there yeah that's it yeah that's the one yeah so that one which that made me feel it, like i felt back in the day where it was like oh chester's still got fire i might not mm. I, just honestly i don't check his stuff as much as i used to back in the yeah. day a lot more um yeah but like yeah, and it's just nice to hear someone like that who's with people like yourself and I think mm. Dyke's on there and other people on there as well, like Jess. And you're like, yeah, man, yeah. It's, it, it's just really nice to see our culture has grown. Like, mm. it hasn't just kind of withered away or, like, yeah. it's not there anymore. Like, I feel a bit bad for, like, the people who are really into punk. Like, yeah. and then, like, by 1986, like, everyone was like, kind of shitting on it. And there wasn't, I don't know, the quality just seemed, didn't seem to be there as much. With mm. us, man, tw- tw- oh, going on, like, yeah, 20 years later, it's like, shit, man. Yeah. Like, it's still really good quality. So, yeah, man. Big yeah, I think that's that. why um, I had to put him in there. It's for the, for the inspiration, man. Like, without Task Force, Mm. Um, you know, it's guys like that, that might not have been flip tricks, might not have been high focus if mm. it wasn't for these guys, you know. So yeah. like the inspiration to me, um, you know, is I'm looking over the whole back catalogue, including the task force, you know, all the MFTC one, two, three, four, five, like mm. that stuff was 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 big uh, yeah. for me. Wicked, wicked. All right, that's uh, that's your third. What else you got? Yeah, uh, yeah. This one, I don't think anyone would guess this one, and it's <laughs> it's off the curve. It's not even hip hop, uh, but it's D double E. D double E. D double. D double. I'm throwing a curveball. I'm throwing a curveball. <laughs> it's a pro- it, yeah, man. Explain. Break it down to me. And I'll tell you why. Like Break for me, down. like. I love I love grime like I listen to a lot of grime like I love hip hop I listen to loads of hip hop but I've also listened to a lot of grime and a lot of road rap and go growing up and stuff and you know I used to go out loads loads of clubs parties and, and stuff all the time and E E for me like uh, his energy on stage like in grime obviously you have wheel ups do you know what I mean like in hip hop you don't really have wheel ups but yeah. in, in grime there's wheel ups are part of the culture and mm. 
it's just the energy uh, that he does. He, like him as a character, he's so uh, he's got so much charisma. He's got like so much style. You know, he can just go ooh ooh, and it's a wheel up, and the whole club's <laughs> going mad. Like he's got so many quotable bars, and um, yeah. I've just enjoyed my I've just enjoyed myself at so many of his and the Newham Generals sets over the years. Like you get a different energy mm. from Grime to hip hop and it's a big energy in in grime and me myself you know all, throughout all of my albums you'll hear me rapping on at least one 140 bpm sort of grime tempo beat on all of my albums even even back to 2007 so it's always been part of my lyrical style when you say the word mc to me that's like master of ceremony that's someone who can grab the mic at any opportunity smash any show over any sort of like tempo and i feel like he, he does that you yeah. know and, yeah um, absolutely yeah definitely it, like you said energy mate it's a, it's a d- yeah. different vibe man it's a different vibe here in that that's- and it's funny like people you know might, might think that's a curveball but for me like <laughs> I mean, I, l- I love it. No, I like it. I like the the variety here is is sick, mate. Mm. I'm enjoying it. It's 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 keeping me on my toes. This top five. So yeah. <laughs> okay. What's what's your next one then, mate? And the next uh, the next one as well is um is also kind of from the grime scene. So maybe something that people might not might think, but um it's gets gets. Um, what why uh, gets? What's what's um what was what's your history me, with gets then? Again, his co- like his flow because I'm really into flow. Mm. And I'm really into content and I'm really into energy. Mm. And I feel like Getz is fierce on the mic. Like he's like, I've literally seen like radio sets of him coming in dressed in like army, <laughs> army gear, you know, like bandana on like black yeah. shades, like literally looking like he's going to war <laughs> to like destroy the mic. And like, yeah. His technical ability is incredible. Like, I think a lot of people who are into like UK hip hop in like inverted commas might probably have not checked him out as as much as they probably should have. But mm-hmm. if if you go back and look at his stuff, like I think in the grime genre, mm-hmm. sometimes people might feel that the content is is one di- is you know can be one dimensional mm-hmm. and not and not too many sides to it. But gets really completely chain you know completely takes it out mm-hmm. uh, out the water. I mean, if I was to clash anyone in the in the UK, like I'd probably be most scared to clash gets because he's just like, you know what I mean? He's just yeah, a yeah, man. yeah. He's just a he's, beast. Like, he's an animal. Yeah. Oh, mate, that's um, amazing okay if, if you were then to recommend like people who may not have listened to get to listen to this pod direct them towards a project they should listen to then man yeah man um ghetto gospel is um mm. is a is a very hard one i mean that one for me i listened to a lot and also freedom of speech i think mm-hmm. that came out in 2014 so freedom of speech I li- you know tunes like commandments he's got that biggie sample in that one i think ah, and, um, yeah 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 I know that. Yeah, that one that was, is, is real hard. But it's also like, that's when you say M- MC, because I have I love watching people rap live. Like I watch a lot of videos of people just rapping mm. to camera, you know, bar sessions, radio sets, live shows. And I take all of that into equation, like when answering, the, the you know, this mm, question, it's not sure. solely down to like the recorded material. It's also down to how much they can just destroy a, a mic. Yeah. Um, it's the whole package, isn't it? That's it. It's really, it's, it's a very tough question. And if you ask me on another day, I might have a completely different answer. <laughs> yeah, for uh, sure, man, for sure. And that's the, the, that's the kind of uh, quicksand this whole thing's built on because it could just be completely different tomorrow. But, but exactly. I, like, you know, I like it. I'm getting a lot of that out of this. Uh, so what we've got here, we've got, we've got uh, Rock Marcy, uh, Getz, D double E, Chester P, and Chester Big P Al. And Big Al. <sighs> That's big. <laughs> that's big. That's big. Yeah, that's a, that's a heavy. I can't fuck with that five. Like, it, I'm not mm. so much into the grind, but I do. F- I, I see it. There's some things you mm. can't deny. Like, I don't know, yeah. some people don't like Doom, but you can't deny mm. that his his patterns are ridiculous. But yeah, yeah, man. Okay, I'm feeling it. Top five. Well done, mate. Got through there <laughs> and uh, unscathed. I think. I think I just had to be for me, like, because I was answering that as a whole, you know, over mm. MC, you know, if you sort of said, who's your top five hip hop artists, you know, it would have been different, but for sure, this for top sure. five MC, that's a, that's a man on the mic. And they're the guys that, that really mm. inspired me and, 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 and gassed me up to, to write my own bars and, and get on the stage and stuff. Yo, what's going on? This is Doc Brown. You're listening to the Crate 808 podcast. Enjoy this week's episode by all means. Just remember to subscribe and rate and review. Peace. If I had to ask you which 90s artist has aged the best, what would you go with? You know, it, I was thinking about this. Um, I think I think R.A. the Rugged Man is doing really well because he's 
he's been around since the very early 90s, I think. Mm-hmm. And Yeah, definitely. Yeah, he's he's been around for a while. And, um, you know, even, you know, Don Sheen's a biggie and he, he's had such a big, like, mad long career. Mm. And, uh, and and he's still really, and what I really like about him as well is he, um, you know, he directs a lot of his own music videos. He's really into film. Mm. Again, for me, for, like, a lot of stuff comes back to flow and content and Rugged Man and his yeah. flow and content is is pretty untouchable. Yeah, it's um, unique, man, isn't it? It's like no one else yeah. like him, really. It's the delivery yeah. as well. It's sick. Okay, mm. that's a good one. I don't think we've had our race. So it's nice to have that change, mate. It's a good shout. Yeah. And obviously we're talking, you've got a label, you're an artist, mm. you've got all these different things going on. Is there any lessons from the 90s we could learn, do you think, now as like an artist or a person who owns a label or even just as mm. a fan? You know what I'd like to see personally, and this is what inspired me so much um, into hip hop in the beginning, was the whole hip hop's not just rapping, it's mm. graffiti it's break dancing it's mm. DJing and mm. for me that whole culture having those four elements to it I did all of that like, I tried mm. all of them break yeah. dancing for really long but, like I gave it a go <laughs> yeah, like yeah. DJing scratching graffiti emptying I loved the whole culture the clothing mm. everything that went around you know smoking weed like mm-hmm. all of that for me it just felt like something bigger than music it wasn't just music there was mm. all these uh, the little elements and you had the connections with them and and someone could not be a rapper they could be a writer and you could just instantly connect and get on with them and you like the same sort of stuff so for me i feel that music as it's gone on as hip-hop's gone on i feel that the four elements of the culture has been left behind it it's it's slipped away you know break dancing really isn't there as much uh djs you know every, Serato is cool and and it's a great thing and stuff, but I don't I don't know if there's as many young guys coming up being like I want to be a sick scratch DJ like mm-hmm. you know I don't know if that if that's there quite as much yeah. um you know the whole sort of scratching element to it beat juggling you know that all comes down to you know and then that takes it to like digging in the crates looking for samples for sure. finding those old dusty vinyls get you know getting the getting yeah. the drum breaks like dig it and i just love that there's more more to it so i would like to see hip-hop culture come back and i'd like mm. to see more of the elements come back and and be more involved uh you know with each other and you know have have some have some graffiti in the videos or break dances. i don't know I, for sure I, I no 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 i feel it i feel it man and yeah man i think uh you know social media has had its massive benefits uh for musicians and artists but i feel it's also had its massive downsides you know, on on society in general and not necessarily mm. about talent. It's about how many followers you've got and, oh, man, and, how, and, what, and what clothes you're wearing and how cool you are. And mm-hmm. it's just all kind of bit like fake and see-through and, mm. and a bit, <laughs> you know, in places a little, a little bit whack or whatever, you yeah, know? Yeah, like, yeah. I, I, I see what you mean, man. Um, yeah. So if we're going to a few list of questions, because I know, uh, I know we've taken a lot of your time, man, but We've got some listener questions as well from Shotgun the Orcs, another brilliant podcast out there for the UK heads. High Focus is about to celebrate its 10-year anniversary. Where do you see the label in 10 years from now? Mm, I would I would like to say, um, you know, just like a world, world, worldwide, uh, no, no name. I'd like to really try and break America. You know, I think a lot of the artists are going to mature, like nice fine wines, you know, like mm. Rockmast, you know what I mean? Coming, mm. And it's really interesting, you know, seeing guys like, like Rockmast and, and Conway and Westside Gun, you know, being in, in their late 30s, um, you know, Rockmast even in his 40s, but, mm. but still so on point and, um, you know, at the, at the peaks of their careers. And that is really inspirational to me. And I think when you work on something for a while, like, you can get a bit disillusioned and be like, oh, am I going to get any further? And mm. this is hard. And, and is it over? Or do they just, do the kids just care about the new young guys coming up? And, mm. you know, you can ask yourself these these questions, but really it's down to like self-belief and, and you know, persevering and believing in yourself. And, and the universe sometimes throws things that you are hard and they're just hurdles that you need to get over to get to the new level. So I feel... Mm. In the last ten years, we've done so much, and now we're just getting ready to, like, you know, level up and take this That's this whole cute. shit further, um, a- along with the rest of the whole country and the scene as we've seen it develop. You know, just mm. keep moving forwards, keep being an inspiration for people out there, for mm. other artists, producers, and also hope that we've done a lot of work in the game that's made it a lot easier for other people to make livings out of it as well even if they you know aren't yeah. affiliated on the label just because of the stuff that that we've done for, Absolutely, the, for the man. 
Yeah. I mean, first of all, that the way you, your outlook there, I'm selling it out right now, man. And, and I'm not like a seasoned dad, but that's a really yeah. good outlook to have with your kid, mate, is yeah. first of all, be very positive <laughs> and to think yeah. any, any, any kind of like spanner that gets thrown in the works, he's got to yeah. overcome it, man. He's got to overcome mm. it, be positive. And the chat about the universe thing, mate, it comes yeah. more to life than ever yeah. when you have a kid because it's like you know uh, there's a lot of things that come to play that kind of feel a little bit like serendipity kind of thing so um mm. so yeah man feel, i feel it i like that i like that that actually really ties in well to your album covers because they're all quite yeah. psychedelic and shit and it's wicked That's you can stare cool. at them for ages especially if you like just, you know drop a bit of acid look at that you're like shit man what am i looking at so yeah That's man it's, I, I, I enjoy all that and i think for me you know while you touch on that subject certain psychedelics have had a, a massive profound impact on me as a person and throughout mm. my music um you know i'm not necessarily advocating or mm. saying that you should do it because you know, it's down to the individual and, and, and it pe- cannot be good for some people and sure. can be for others. But for me, for my personal development as a human being, mm. as a creative artist, as getting over, you know, things that pe- individuals might battle with, it, it's been profoundly positive, massively helped my creativity, led me to have a, a way healthier diet, a way better outlook on life, led me to read tons of books, getting into mm. knowledge without some cheesy did like ex- expand my mind no know? but that's mate in today's world more than anything it's it's yeah. more acceptable now man people use it for therapy you yeah. hear rogan and duncan Tr- all these people are out there who are advocating yeah. for it like you said not for everyone but trust me man yeah. that, that you can see it in the drive and creativity of someone be it you don't yeah. you may not even like high focus you may not even like this the, the music itself yeah. but what you can't deny is there's the creativity the drive the work ethic mm-hmm. It yeah. comes from somewhere you couldn't be in a negative energy space and do that, if you know what I mean. Sorry to sound all hippie, but you know what I mean? Like And like, you know, talking about, you know, drugs for me in my life, I've never I've never done coke, I've never done K, I've never mm. sniffed anything up my nose in my in my life. And I've just worked with plants that have come from mm. the ground. Uh, you know, mushrooms, ayahuasca, you know, DMT. Um, I treat it as medicine for the soul. I do it very respectfully in mm. respectful setting. And it's been good for me, man. It's yeah. been, I feel um, it. I yeah. feel it, man. <laughs> Definitely. What was that DMT trip like? Jeez, man. Yeah. <laughs> that is man, man, life-changing, life-changing. I'll tell you what, basically, third, the third eye of the storm, which was my album that came out in 2012, if you listen to that, and if you look at the artwork, if anyone's got the CD or vinyl, you open that mm. on the on the left hand side. It's a very dark picture being painted as like, you know, the world is, is, is crumbling. It's all on fire. It's CCTV mm. everywhere. Everyone all in suits going to work. And then it, and then the artwork pans over to finally reach paradise. And that whole album, mm. it started off, it starts off quite do- dark. It's like the storm. Then there's like water your door. Then mm. there's frontline terror. It's hard. And then it comes through and it goes, you know, paradise, finding paradise. Mm. Then there's uh, see the sun. Then at the end, the sun's down. And right at the end of creating that album is when I did my first uh, DMT trip and oh. had a completely out of body experience breakthrough and it literally completely changed my whole entire life. Like I became a vegetarian. Like the next day I, I started just in meditation. I started doing lucid dreaming. Mm. I start I started um taking no you know, like natural uh, supplements and stuff. Mm. Uh, have you, you, know, done, have you done isolation pods or anything yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done them as well. I've done a couple of those. Um Wicked. And and uh, the, that's why at the end of the album I've got a six and a half minute uh, like skit of Terence McKenna. I think it they, might have actually had I, to come offline. But if you've got the vinyl version or the CD, yeah. you can hear it. And I remember Kimo being like, "You're mad, bro! Like, why do you want to put <laughs> six and a half minutes of this guy talking?" But I was like, he explains like yeah, what I've just been through. Yeah. Um, it's Terence and then, McKenna, man. Like he's a genius. Like he has he has things to say. So I felt like I wanted to put that out there, and then. Yeah. When I had the explosion and, and I started reading loads, doing loads of knowledge in, and, and that led me to create the album, The Road to the Interdimensional Piff Highway. Mm. That's when it's all interdimensional. And I made that album in like two weeks. And mm. that for me is probably my most, you know, sort of like spiritual yeah. sort of kind of album. I released that on uh, the 12th of the 12th of the 12th. And um, yeah, I had a lot of crazy experiences around, yeah, you know, surrounding that album. And yeah, um, yeah man. And then, you know, you can go a bit, far with it and then you you need to level down and you need to ground yourself and you need to 
work out uh, you know how you're operating in in on planet earth and that yeah yeah yeah. for sure man for sure yeah i think you need both man you need both you need Mm -hmm. to be able to get to there and and back do you know what i mean another question we have here is how do you navigate between being an artist and running a label without filtering Mm -hmm. on your personal goals and that's from uh, luke menace yeah you know it's hard man um like i say high focus i run i go to work 10 to 6 every day monday to friday Mm -hmm. then a lot of times i'm lapping over having to do bits and bobs uh you know at home in the evening sometimes and and i just make time for my flip chick solo stuff i just have to even Mm -hmm. if i'm tired or not i'm going studio i'm going to do it i still just have that buzz and urge to want to create music so it's, it's a tough to juggle and the thing is if i hadn't have done high focus it would mm. probably be about 25 flip tricks albums <laughs> yeah, yeah no lie <laughs> the scene would have been a very could have been a very different place and i could have made all those albums but i would have had no maybe had no platform like the whole game could have been so different so like I put a lot of time and a lot of effort into a lot of people's careers and that has had a knock on effect on my own one. There would have been a lot more flip tricks. There would have been loads more videos mm. and stuff. But also you don't want to oversaturate the market. And I think it's working out. It's well, it's working out well. You know, it's a big family. It gave me a job. It gave me, you know, something to do. But yeah, sometimes, you know, without lying, I do look at some of the top artists on the label who are doing really really well solo artists and be like oh man i wish i could just go and spend a day (laughs) three days in the studio like you do i wish i could just go to the park and like Mm. you know smoke weed or whatever and and Mm. and go with my mates for a couple days and but i can't because i have to go to the office to do accounts or or like set up all these social media posts or or whatever and and yeah that that, but that's just part and parcel you know that's it man that's it but like you said right at the top man you could be one of those Mm. people going on the train looking miserable do you know what I mean? Exactly. So, At least I'm going in happy and coming home happy and, and doing what I love, you know? Exactly, man. Exactly. And then our last question we've got, um, obviously, there's an album coming. Is there a four, mm. four hours UK tour? Uh, DJ Jaffa from Cardiff wants to know, are you going to be hitting Cardiff as well? Yeah, man, there is. Uh, there's the whole uh, big UK tour in the works and uh, European one as well. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll get down to Cardiff for him as well. I haven't got that date on him, but we're aiming to hit up all the, all the big cities in the UK, so... Kid. Should be getting done that way, yeah. Wicked, man. Well, man, thank you, Flip Tricks, man, for jumping on, giving us the time of your mm. hectic schedule. One last thing then before I do go, because I forgot, and I know you mentioned Woo and how much you love the Woo. Mate, we've we, <laughs> we've got our um, Slept on Wu-Tang Bangers playlist. So it kind of has evolved with this bit of a monster where we initially started doing our chats and saying there's so much music coming from the Woo and their solo efforts that you forget there's actual hidden gems. So is there yeah. like a hidden Wu-Tang banger that you would say, you know what, this one deserves a bit more respect? Oh, it's hard, it's hard to... Uh... <laughs> it is a hard one because there's so much of them. Hmm. Oh, it's hard, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I bump uh, Method Man to cow, to cow a lot, but that's not really a hidden... Uh, I don't know. Really... I don't know. I think we did to cow and there was a lot of people came out, they were like, do you know what, I haven't heard that album like properly. And you're like, what? Yeah. To cow? How have you not heard to cow? Sandman yeah. on there is... What a track. Mm, yeah, that is that is a strong track. So yeah, man, I'd say I'd say something from there. Yeah, okay, bring the okay. pain. I've enjoyed it. Bring the pain. Like it. Like it, man. Yeah. So before you go, could you just tell mm. us what is the last great piece of music you heard? Could be old, could be new. Just the last great piece you heard. Mm, oh, um, oh, one of my one of my favorite tunes is uh, Jimi Hendrix, "All Along the Watchtower." Like, nice. Nice. I don't know why. I don't know why it is, man. That tune does sing to me. Like I think maybe my dad must have listened to it tons of growing up, and it's just like embedded in me. But I don't know, man. That, it's a classic. It's, it's a classic yeah. for a reason, man. It's a classic for a mm. reason. Well, I like it. Yeah. I'm gonna know, I'm gonna bump Jim, Jimmy for you now tonight. I'm gonna bump some Jimmy, and yeah, <laughs> sorted. But thank you, man. Uh, all the best of luck with the album. Link us up at some point, and uh, yeah, man. Uh, looking forward to the new album. Wicked. Definitely. Much love, bruv. Big up. Thank you. Peace. Thank you, mate. Peace. <laughs>